Hello everybody, welcome to Bitcoin Not Crypto. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about ETH and I'm specifically going to be telling the story about the DAO hack and the reversal of the ledger of ETH and how this really is a disaster, how um, it lost all credibility because of this event and how it really doesn't compete with Bitcoin at all. And I think, uh, it's a very confusing narrative that ETH has now. And if you look at its chart, it's going to zero against Bitcoin for many different reasons. Staking, uh, you know, proof of stake being one of them, which I'm not going to get into here. But um, the DAO hack is what I'm going to tell you about. And before I do, if you do want to get yourself some Bitcoin, the best way possible, in my opinion, is to get it through Bitcoin Well, which is a non-custodial exchange with the lowest fees in the US and Canada, non-KYC options. And if you use my link and my code, which is in the description, you'll get yourself some free Bitcoin. What could be better than free Bitcoin? A DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. And in this case, it was basically a smart contract where people could send their ETH and they would get a DAO token. And this fund that was built, um, basically it was like a smart contract wallet of Ethereum or ETH um, on the Ethereum network. It was to fund uh, projects within ETH. And so it's kind of a cool, like, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations are kind of a cool idea, and I think there is some use to them. And I think that what happened here is uh, an interesting case for why not to use the Ethereum chain to do these kind of things. Um, and we'll talk more about that. But this happened on June 17th, uh, 2016. And basically, somebody was able to find a vulnerability within the DAO smart contract itself. So this wasn't hacking Ethereum, the Ethereum network or anything like that. It was actually a vulnerability found within the DAO. And they were able to get 3.6 million ETH uh, worth about $60 million at the time. The DAO was actually built and developed by a company called Slock.it. And that was a German-based uh, blockchain startup. Um, they've kind of developed some decentralized apps. Uh, the creator of the DAO was also backed by Vitalik Buterin, who's the founder of Ethereum. So they're all kind of like hands in hands and really wanted this DAO to succeed and didn't want these individuals to be affected by something like a hack. So that kind of goes into what their choice was. Um, as you can see, it's it's really a who's who kind of game in these centralized blockchains and ecosystems like Ethereum clearly is, in my opinion. So to get into some of the technical here, I've just written down the attacker used a method that allowed them to repeatedly split uh, the decentralized autonomous organization tokens into smaller amounts, triggering a recursive withdrawal of funds from the DAO contract before the system could register the transaction as final. So basically it was like in this limbo period, he was able to just consistently withdraw um, ETH by continuing to split the DAO token down into smaller pieces. So initially after the hack, Vitalik Buterin uh, went onto the forums and started talking about how that um, the hack should stand, that the immutability of the ledger is important, and that um, you know one hack was a big setback, but uh, you know they didn't actually hack the Ethereum uh, code, but just the DAO had a vulnerability. The worries here, of course, is that they didn't want to scare away future investors and future users of the Ethereum ecosystem. So they wanted to, you know, make it clear that this wasn't a breach in Ethereum security. This was a breach in the DAO itself. But, you know, how much did this really affect um, investors, right? Maybe they still would see, you know, investors would hear about this hack and say, okay, I don't want anything to do with that, even with the fact that it wasn't an Ethereum necessarily problem. So what's very interesting about this is all of this happens very quickly. So on June 22nd, um, 2016, that is only five days after the hack happens, a proposal for a hard fork is formally in introduced by Vitalik Buterin himself. So he goes back on what he talked about, about, not, about allowing this hack to stand. And he says, let's hard fork this thing. And what we'll do is we will use a time machine basically to go back in time to create a, uh, an, 
a brand new blockchain that has all the history of Ethereum, um, but uh, it's before the hack. And then it would create a new contract for the investors of the DAO and it would allow the um, basically those funds to go back to the people that had invested in the DAO originally. And this would prevent the hacker from accessing the stolen funds. Um, the hard fork proposal was put up to a community vote. And although there was no formal on-chain referendum, which means that there wasn't any sort of tokenized way to vote on this, uh, there's you know government uh, governance tokens, and you know even the DAO token was technically a governance token. So they could have done something like that and actually allowed the full community to vote on something like this. Um, the vote was more of a consensus process where the key developers, miners, and other influential members of the community weighed in. And let's remember here, Vitalik Buterin is the top boy. He is the one, the founder of Ethereum. So what he says ha throws a ton of weight around in this community. And the majority of the community and developers came to a consensus to favor the hard fork. Um, largely due to the significance of the amount of stolen ETH and the desire to protect investors' confidence and reputation of the Ethereum network. Once again, this goes back to who this money affected, who this hack affected, right? It was key investors, it was um, big money, it was VC, it was investors, and you know, a lot of people talk about VC coins now and it's uh, Ethereum is funded by a lot of VCs. There was a huge pre mine. There was a lot of people that have a lot of stake again, not proof of stake, but a lot of just investment into this ecosystem um, running properly. And a hack like this does not look good. So some of the developers and community members felt like the immutability of the blockchain should take precedence and that the hack should be allowed to stand as part of Ethereum's history. Now, this was the big moment that created Ethereum Classic, which is a off-chain. So Ethereum Classic is the, the chain of Ethereum that allowed the hack to stand. And the Ethereum that we all know now um, that is going to nothing against Bitcoin, I mean, Ethereum Classic is too, but the Ethereum that we all know as ETH, it uh, it's actually a, a completely separate chain and is actually more changed than Ethereum Classic is. Ethereum Classic is still running on proof of work and has like a complete lack of developers within the ecosystem. And the what's interesting about this actually is that um, there was uh, you know Ethereum Classic existed and it's a hard fork, so people that have ETH also have Ethereum Classic and they can decide what to do with either of these coins. And so the hacker, when this hard fork got implemented, um, got, you know, the funds of ETH got uh, frozen, but the funds of Ethereum Classic were still accessible by this hacker because he had successfully taken them, right? You know, this is the proof of work that this hacker did. And, you know, he actually, you know, figured something out and I'm not saying what he did is a good thing, but he figured out a little exploit and was able to exploit that and, you know, got some gain from it. And there was, uh, you know, there's a difficulty for that hacker. I looked into some of this research, but he has moved some of those coins to different wallets and um, a lot of it hasn't moved. And I think it would be really difficult for them to even be able to sell any of this. But uh, he probably did profit somewhat, but didn't definitely didn't get all of the coins as this is uh, still, you know, viewable on the Ethereum Classic uh, ledger. Now, what, what's also very interesting about this is literally a year later, two hacks targeting popular ETH wallets um, happened. One of them burned 150,000 ETH, which was worth about $30 million US. And the other one stole half a million ETH, which was worth 150 million because of the price appreciation of ETH within those two time frames. Uh, they didn't reverse these, um, even though the dollar amounts are a lot more, the ETH amount is a lot less, but that's just based on, you know, the conversion price to US dollars. 
Um, but you know, again, this was a smart contract uh, vulnerability. This wasn't a problem with ETH exactly. This was, uh, but you know, it was just like, uh, you know, this ETH wallet, whatever. It's not a bunch of VCs. It isn't backed by Vitalik Buterin. Um, it's their problem. It's all of the users' faults and problems for using that wallet. Like basically, that's callously how they viewed this compared to the DAO hack, which they literally broke broke the immutability of the ledger. And um, you know, cryptocurrency is a lot of things combined into one. And one of those things is the blockchain. And the blockchain is the ledger. And what's very important about a blockchain, in my opinion, is truth and the um, history of it being accessible. And when they go in reverse, when they reverse an event like this because they don't like it, it shows uh, that it's completely centralized, that this can be overturned by a few members of the community within five days of it happening. I'm sure there were tons of ETH users who were not you know, daily users, but had ETH or were involved in ETH, didn't even know that this hack happened. And they had no ability to vote on what we want to happen with this network. So it's just crazy to me to, to threaten the immutability of a ledger when the blockchain is so important in a cryptocurrency, especially in understanding security. The, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain is the longest running, most secure, most immutable ledger ever to exist. And in my opinion, ETH doing this by changing the immutability of their ledger, by changing the ledger itself, and by lowering the level of immutability and showing how centralized of an ecosystem they have, they have completely stepped aside from competing with Bitcoin. They now compete with every other centralized uh, smart contract tokenization platform to exist into the future. And they can claim to be more decentralized than Sol or Solana. Um, it really doesn't matter. This, this one event in history proves that they don't matter as, as being a sound uh, store of value or a medium of exchange or a money like Bitcoin does. And it also shows to me that they don't matter on a smart contract platform because they're just as centralized as any other one. So the hard fork was activated July 20th. So it did take a little bit of time. They had to roll out some code, all this stuff. You know, this happened uh, June. So it was about a month later, right? And they rolled back um, the blockchain. You know, they just took a time machine, right? Like, you know, history doesn't matter, right? You know, the, the proof of of transactions none of these transactions that happen you know none of that matters right we can just go back in time we can change whatever part of history we want and uh they created a new contract where the original dow token holders could withdraw the hacker's wallet was also locked and this created the hard fork of ethereum and ethereum classic in my opinion this should have been a huge wake-up call to anybody involved in ethereum at the time of course Ethereum has gone up in value compared to the US dollar, but over the, those years from 20, uh, you know, 16 to now, Bitcoin has outperformed. Bitcoin will continue to outperform because it is the most secure ledger and security and decentralization. Decentralization is part of security. That is what matters for money. It needs to be permissionless. It needs to not be controlled. It needs to be issued in a way that makes sense and is fair and it needs to be accessible by everybody that's permissionless right and uh bitcoin has bitcoin has done that and ethereum has proved not to do that and now they compete with all of these lesser cryptos for you know smart contract capability and issuing stable coins on them and all of this and all of that will be eaten up by lightning and layer twos on bitcoin in my opinion into the future anyway because that stuff is that's a lesser market than the base layer of money and that is still a market that will eventually want to happen and be settled on the most secure longest running proof of work uh, consensus mechanism of the bitcoin blockchain it just doesn't make sense to me at all to believe in ethereum 
to hold Ethereum. I think it is uh, oftentimes when people get into this space, they just think, well, it's the second biggest crypto, you know, I'll hold 50% Bitcoin, 30% Ethereum, and some shit coins in there as well. And they don't view Ethereum as a shit coin, and it 100% is. It is terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. Um, this is one reason it's terrible and it sucks. And there are many others that I could get into as well. And maybe I will, if this video proves to be interesting to viewers and, um, maybe I'll make a follow up. Maybe I'll talk about the merge and the switch from proof of work to proof of stake. And how, again, this was another nail in the coffin of it being a store of value and being money. And Ethereum has just changed up. It's, you know, at one point it was the world's computer. It was, uh, you know, Bitcoin's, it would, it was, um, it was oil to Bitcoin's gold. It was ultrasound money because it had a deflationary, uh, part in it at one point. Now it's incredibly, uh, inflationary has no max supply. It, it just doesn't make sense that they would ever try to compete with Bitcoin. And that's why they don't anymore. They don't, they don't have that narrative of ultrasound money. They now need to create some other narrative because they're just being beaten and their market share is being eaten up by all these other cryptos, um, that can do the same thing as Ethereum does, but way cheaper and way faster. And that's all pump and dumpers care about. <laughs> they don't care about its uh, mild decentralization that really is just nonsense anyway, because you can see how centralized it is when they have things happen like the DAO hack. So thanks everybody for watching. If you wanna secure your Bitcoin for future generations, you should do so the best way possible, which is with Stamp Seed. They're a titanium plate that can withstand fires and corrosion resistant uh the best you know best way to store seed phrase in my opinion for sure and you can get 15 percent off using my code btc not crypto 15 and use the link in my description thanks everybody and we'll see you on the next one